And we have now here on the table a very a large format, still schematic, but a, an enlarged model of that Cas9 protein. And what you see here is that the white foam on this placement, this is the protein. It's a large protein. I think it's about 1,500 amino acids long. It has multiple domains on it. Uh, here's the guide RNA. Uh, but before we go through this in detail, let me show you this model. So this is a 3D printed model based on the atomic coordinates of, of the actual structure of this protein solved by x-ray diffraction. And I, I'm going to just remove one of the many domains of protein structure from this 3D printed model so that you can better see how it binds to DNA as well as and how the guide RNA interrogates the DNA. So we have a double-stranded DNA that's made up of a, of a light blue and a dark blue strand. And the double-stranded DNA comes into the Cas9 enzyme here. And you won't be able to see this, but there's a particular sequence in this double-stranded DNA that's referred to as the, as the uh, PAM sequence. PAM stands for protospacer adjacent motif. For Cas9, it's it's NGG, which uh, the N means it can be anything, any of the four nucleotides followed by a G and another G. So whenever this enzyme finds two Gs, it'll bind to that double-stranded DNA. And then the first thing is it does, it separates the light blue from the dark blue strand. And it has bound this orange guide RNA in such a way that the end of the guide RNA attempts to base pair with the, with the target strand, the dark blue strand of DNA here. And only if it can form perfect Watson-Crick base pairs with that dark blue strand over a 20 nucleotide long sequence, will this enzyme become active. And when I say active, there's an enzyme, there's a nuclease active site here, which will cut the dark blue strand. And there's another enzyme uh, nuclease site over here that will cut the light blue strand. And let me see if I can do this then. So there's the double-stranded cut that this enzyme can make only if the guide RNA is exactly complementary to the dark blue DNA strand. So that's what that's what the Cas9 enzyme does. That's how it works in its real three-dimensional structure. So again, the white is the is the schematic Cas9 protein. And then the guide RNA, just as in the previous adaptive immunity kit, it's represented by three different colors of foam. In this model, all of the RNA is orange. And I'll just point out again that RNA folds up into a complex 3D shape, just like protein. So keep that in mind. This, this white Cas9 protein binds guide RNA in a very specific way so that five prime end of the guide RNA is poised, it's, it's positioned just in the right spot where it can interrogate this dark blue strand of target DNA. All right, so while it's all orange here, here's the orange part that was transcribed from the tracer gene. And then here's the black part that was transcribed from the short palindromic repeat. And then here's the purple spacer that was in between the two palindromic repeats. And then this thing on the end here, this is what's going to win Jennifer Doudna a Nobel Prize because she and her colleagues figured out that they could actually connect these dual RNAs into a single guide RNA with this little tetra loop. So at that point, it became much easier to make these guide RNAs that would then program this particular Cas9 enzyme to recognize a DNA sequence that was complementary to this purple sequence. So this model is, of course, all glued down on this tabletop so that we can use it in presentations like this. But what your students would do is they have to construct this out of the pieces. And if they can position this double-stranded bacteriophage sequence 
in the Cas9 with the PAM sequence right here, the NGG, which is, which is indicated on this placemat that you can't see. But if they position the DNA correctly, they can then ask if this top strand, the target strand, is complementary to the purple guide RNA. And if it is, and only if it is, then these two distinct nuclease sites on the enzyme are activated. So this nuclease site cuts the top strand, this nuclease site cuts the bottom strand, at which point you can remove this double-stranded fragment. And we could go ahead and take the other one apart as well. So we have introduced a cut, a double-stranded cut, in the human genome at a sequence which is statistically unique. So if you want to edit the human genome, you simply make a guide RNA in which these 16 to 20 nucleotides represent now the beta globin gene. And then you will, you will direct, you can target this enzyme to that particular gene and make that cut. Now, what does that do? Well, that only cuts the human genome in a specific gene at a specific site, which is no small feat. But that's only the beginning of editing the DNA. You then have to somehow affect a change at that particular sequence. And, and what happens next then is something that is too complex for us to get into in this kind of a short video session. Uh, but suffice it to say that CRISPR people are very, very clever researchers. And you would, you, you'll be amazed as you learn about how different modifications of this cleavage reaction have been used then to affect more and more specific uh, changes to the sequence of that particular gene. I'll just mention there's something called base editing now. And, and you start off by inactivating one of the two nuclease sites and then you change one of these bases, actually in the non-target strand, you, you change it without ever cutting a phosphodiester bond. You, you basically deaminate a C cytosine to become a uridine, which then becomes a thymine. So you can change a C to a T in the non-target strand without ever cutting this DNA strand. That's amazing technology.